wasn't born rich. Golly, I was hustling garbage bags door to door, so that was my first little empire. It's kind of, wow, this guy really is a little different. He wasn't always respected. Fired me, fired me on the spot. And he's always been outspoken. I said, screw you. You could manage a Dairy Queen. Come on now, Katie. But I refuse to sit next to Mark at a Mavericks games. My emotions have never gotten me in trouble. It's so wrong! They've just got me fined. That's the place to be. That's the hot spot. But today, Mark Cuban is the owner of the Dallas Mavericks. Mark Cuban, come on! A multi-billionaire. One of you is going to walk away with a million dollars. The benefactor. It's so him. And his story is unlike any other. I'm still a geek at heart. I was trying to say, OK, if I'm 90 years old and I'm looking back at my life, Am I going to regret doing or not doing something? I grew up in a, a part of Pittsburgh, a suburb called Scott Township, and in a section called Birdland, where all the streets were named after birds, and I lived on Meadowlark. I was always into something. As long as I can remember, I've been a business person at heart. I remember being 12 years old, and I was like, 12 years old, Dad? You know, how am I going to earn any money? And he hooked me up selling these cheap-ass, flimsy, flimsy garbage bags that we sold $6 for 100 I mean, who's going to say no to a smiley little kid walking up? Golly, I was hustling garbage bags door to door, so that was my first little empire. My friends, I'm sure they did laugh. They laughed when I got jobs working as a stocking clerk. I would give disco lessons, and I would DJ and collect stamps, repackage baseball cards. I think really what it told me was don't be afraid of the unknown. I wanted to take business classes. At Mount Lebanon High School, you couldn't take a business class unless you were a senior. So I said, screw you. I went to the University of Pittsburgh and started taking night classes. So I did OK and got some decent grades. At the end of the day, I wasn't going to be able to stay there because there wasn't a business school. And I wanted to go heavily into business. And I picked out the cheapest one, and it was IU. I first met Mark at Indiana University. I was in a fraternity, and he owned the local bar that everybody wanted to go to called Motley's Pub. I took my financial aid money from my senior year, and I just went for it. When most people at that age, all you're worried about is going to class and going out drinking and maybe your grades a little bit, Mark was already being an entrepreneur. I just said, OK, I'm going to see if I can get a real job. I picked up and went down to Dallas. He has no money, and he decides to get into this computer industry that nobody knows anything about. I mean, it's 1983. I saw a Help Wanted ad for this little company called Your Business Software. I walked in there. That guy said, if you work with PCs, and I told him, I can sell, and you know, I'm a great salesperson. He goes, perfect, you're hired. And so that was the start of my PC business. One day, I had a great sale I could close. I was going to make a $1,500 commission. And I called up Michael Humecki, and I said, I want to go close this deal. It's great sales, and it's a great commission for me. He goes, no. You have to open the store. I, I got to close this deal. So I blew him off, went and closed the deal, fired me. Fired me on the spot. That was Memorial Day weekend, 1983. Mark's the kind of person you get to a wall, and all that means is you either go through it around it, whatever it is, but you're going to the next step. I had a customer, Architectural Lighting. I went to them, I said, if you'll front me the money for this first um, time of building software package, then I'll have enough to get this business started. And they said, OK, you've been great to us. I went back to some of my Your Business Software customers, and I said, I'll come out, and I'll spend time with you. I'll train you. I'll teach you how to create batch files on your IBM XT. But I was pretty much ready to take on all comers. So that was 1983 when I started it, and that was the foundation for microsolutions. As I got into it, PCs were coming up, and I was like, it just makes perfect sense that we're going to start hooking up PCs together. We had 85 employees. We were doing two and a half, three million million, $3 million a month in revenue. I got a letter one day saying, hey, consultant was representing a, a large company who's interested in acquiring you, and had the meeting, and it turns out it was CompuServe. And 
we sold to CompuServe for $6 million, and it was 1990, so I was officially retired at that point. And it won't be the last time as Mark becomes a millionaire. I went out with my buddies to celebrate, and we got shit face. <laughs> By 1990, 32-year-old Mark Cuban is worth millions. Now that his company has been sold to CompuServe, he's free to enjoy his fortune. I just had a blast. You'll never know. While living it up in Los Angeles, California, he still keeps up with the business world. Because I was a technology, my broker would always call and ask me questions. I was like, why are you asking me these dumb questions? They're like, because people in the market don't know the answers to them. You do. And I was like, I knew more than the products of some people in the company because I was using them. I was installing them myself. And I'm like, I can make some money this way. So that's what I did. From 1993, all I did was trade stocks. I had my Stairmaster face in the ocean, and I would get up at CNBC or at CNN, whatever it was that I'd had on. I had my phone for the broker, and I would buy and sell stocks while I was doing Stairmaster face in the ocean. I mean, it was, it was a great life. I did that until I went back to Dallas in 94. I would have different meetings with buddies of mine and say, let's just go get a beer, let's go hang out. Todd Wagner, who I went to college with, he was like, you know, there's got to be a way to listen to Indiana basketball over all this new internet stuff. I mean, we were both two homesick Indiana basketball fans, not able to get our, you know, our dose, you know, we get our, our fix of Indiana basketball, and we couldn't get it. I'm like, that's a cool idea. I was still a geek at heart, and I keep up with all the technology, and I'd buy the first of everything, you know, and in my house, I'd have a LAN and this and that, and I was wired, so I had all the toys. So I, I felt confident in, in being able to figure things out, so I said, okay, let's see what I can do. Mark has an ability to just will things to happen, and that's very unique. I got online and started downloading anything and everything related to multimedia on the internet, and AudioNet was born in the second bedroom of my house. It literally started back in the day, you know, a little old 486 computer with a, you know, $15 radio that was hooked up to the back. And I remember going to the bathroom and I kicked the radio down and it like disconnected the, you know, the plug in the back. And I'm like, he's like, we're off the air. And it's like, oops, you know, like, I mean, that was the broadcast station. We started at AudioNet because there was really no consideration to video over the internet at that point in time. We originally started thinking, okay, we'll listen to sporting events and that'll be cool and we'll sell advertising around it. We got the bright idea. The same application for sporting events or music or whatever could also be used for business. If we can handle 20,000 simultaneous listeners, that proved the technology out to be able to go to Motorola and say you no longer have to rent satellite time and shepherd your people into all these theaters to be able to get a message from the CEO. Instead, you just have them sit at their desktops and we can pipe that message right to their desktop. And that's where AudioNet started to become successful. Then once video hit, you couldn't stay audio net in a world that had audio and video. That's why we had to change the name. We decided on broadcast.com. That got us going. We were the multimedia device and the communications device for broadcast communications on the desktop in corporate America. When things like Clinton's grand jury testimony, we knew that the minute the word cigar was uttered, when this hits, it's going to be the biggest thing we've ever done. Ever. Not everybody agreed with me, but it turns out I was right, and it was just huge. Then from there, we did the Victoria's Secret fashion show, Sex Sells, and we took advantage of that. Business was great. We were rocking and rolling. We went public July 18th, 1998. We're just two kids from the Midwest. This isn't supposed to happen. I mean, I'm a kid from Gary, Indiana. Mark's from Pittsburgh. You know, we're, we're not exactly like, you know, growing up with a silver spoon in our mouths. We priced at $18 and closed at $62.75. And we had the biggest one-day gain in Wall Street history when we went public. Before the IPO, we went to try to hook up some strategic partners, one of them being Yahoo, and we let them buy in to develop a relationship with them. But Yahoo wants more than a partnership. They want the entire company. Selling to Yahoo was a good move because I felt like it gave stability to our business. It took care of our employees. By the way, everyone told us we were stupid. You guys, why are you selling for $5 billion? In a year, this company will be worth twice that. Seems good to us. Seems like a good deal. We're selling. We did a stock transaction valued at $5.7 billion, and we sold to Yahoo on April Fool's Day, 1999. It was a ride.
you just like riding the ride. Just like, okay, when does this end? Mark is now richer than he ever imagined, and he's about to make his wildest dreams come true. We're really gonna knock a few people on their butts. After selling Broadcast.com to Yahoo for $5.7 billion in 1999. I dreamed about, you know, having billions of dollars. Yeah, of course, it still doesn't seem real. Mark is living the dream. He buys a private jet over the internet, a new mansion. There was not furniture there. And then there was a huge ballroom, a grand room. They used that for wiffle ball. You get to buy the Dallas Mavericks. I was a season ticket holder. If you saw me at a game, I was screaming at the refs. I was getting into it. I was supporting players. I was at the opening night of the 99-2000 season. I mean, it's opening night. You're undefeated. And I'm looking around thinking, this is crazy. It's not a sellout. There's no energy in the building. There's no excitement to it. This team was the worst team in the league for years. And at that point, we were probably at our lowest. I could do better than this. Ding, 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 ding. You know, now I can finally afford to put my money where my mouth is. The timing was right. I overpay for the team, I get the basketball team, and we all have fun with it. The first time I ever saw Mark, he reminded me of a frat brother. His feeling was we needed some new paint on the walls, we needed an injection of energy and passion to take the whole operation to the next level. When he left the room, my dad and I looked at each other like, we think we just you know, died and went to heaven. Mark embraced the Nelsons when they were in the darkest hour, and that will never be forgotten. He buys them in overnight. They've got a winning record for the rest of the season. That defies logic. It's all about winning, and it's all about having fun. My job is to do what I can to win. Pick a spot, any spot. Get together the right players, putting them in a position to succeed by giving them the resources they need. Mark's philosophy is every one of those players is treated like a rock star. They get everything from, you name it, custom locker rooms, $50,000 DVD units in each locker. The Jet 757 was purchased and completely gutted and retrofitted. Those guys are like Lamborghinis to us. I approach it the same way I do every one of my businesses, to know the business inside and out so that I can improve it to make it better. as I started experiencing it and getting more involved and realizing that it was about the experience when you went to a game. He wanted this experience to be one that everyone in the Metroplex said, listen, I've got to be there. That is the place to be. That's the hot spot. A Mavericks home game is a circus. We're selling fun. The casual fan, the marginal fan, didn't remember the score. They remember who they had a beer with. If it's a parent, they remember the look on their kids' faces. And, and if anything, from a technology, the, the best move that I made was putting my email address up on the Jumbotron during the game. It all goes to accessibility. And Cuban decided they need to be able to touch me. If somebody wants to complain about the nachos or complain about the point guard, they need some place to go. You can say, trade the bum. You can say, I love dirt. You can tell me about chewing gum underneath your seat. Whatever it may be, I get well over a 1,000 emails a day. This was my chance to reach hundreds, if not thousands, of Mavs fans. Oh, you and me both. I'm so ready. Can't wait. Even with the billion dollars, he's still just another Joe Schmo fan. He's fun. He's into it. He's yelling. He's screaming. He's being a fan. People expect owners to behave a certain way. Mark looks at him, why? I behaved this way before. And trust me, Mark's been the same way. It's just that before, it wasn't Mark Cuban. It was just some guy. I've got a, a very much a, a fiscal vested interest in this, you know, a $300 million plus investment and having it run and operated to what I think is the highest possible standard. My emotions have never gotten me in trouble. They've just got me fined. I got fined half a million dollars for saying the guy who ran the officiating group couldn't run a Dairy Queen. Well, guess what? He's not there anymore. I said it because I believed it and I said it because it would create an issue. What I didn't expect was Dairy Queen to come back and say, how can you insult us like that? You couldn't manage a Dairy Queen, and we challenged you to do it. I was like, hey, let's have some fun. Let's go do it. 
Okay, I'm gonna do my training early in the morning. I'll serve ice cream, there'll be a few media members there. Then all of a sudden I have an interview with the Today Show Katie Couric, who just rips me apart. Come on now, Katie, you haven't been in my shoes, you don't know the circumstance. So I go after her and rip her right back. Sometimes money's not the issue, Katie, and that's what the situation is here. Then she cut off the interview real sharp. All of a sudden, and there was you know traffic jams and a line a mile and a half long for me to serve him ice cream, and then there was helicopters up above. It just turned into a circus that took on a life of its own. But it was fun. It wasn't so much Cuban out of control as it was Cuban uh, on a crusade. This is kind of my way of saying, okay, you think it's such a bad thing, I'm gonna turn it into a positive. Whatever I find, I'm gonna match with funding to a charity. And when I got fined the half a million dollars on the Dairy Queen thing, our coach, Don Nelson, had gone through prostate cancer. So I donated the money to the Huntsman Center for prostate research. What do I enjoy most about the NBA? It's a really different challenge for me, and there's such a drama rush just of, of trying to win. But Mark's not done taking on new challenges, and what's coming next will be the biggest one yet. By 2001, Mark Cuban is a multi-billionaire with his own basketball team, but he's still not done taking on new challenges. Mark bet on a new generation of high-definition content and created HDNet. I absolutely believe Mark is scary brilliant. We went out and bought some cameras and started putting together some content. What little content was out there, we got the license real cheap because no one wanted it because there was no other demand for it. There was no other 24-hour high-def network. We put in our own money. All of this is 100% ourselves funded. So we, we gobbled up all that we could and created HDNet and created HDNet movies. We want those to be very, very important channels to people. And so we're trying to create content that people go, God, I want to watch that. That is a very cool movie that was shot in high def. Now the theater chain, we're going to put in digital equipment so that we can digitally project these movies. We don't need to ship reels of film around the world. 2929 Entertainment is kind of the umbrella or the holding company. We really have six different entities. So what we have is a domestic theatrical distribution company. There we've done movies like Capturing the Freedmen's Control Room, Woman Thou Art Loosed. Then we also have Reicher Entertainment, which is really the film and TV library. Syndication rights to Nash Bridges and Sex in the City, along with uh, about 40 movies such as Primal Fear and Kiss the Girls, plus HDNet, plus Landmark Theater Chain. Two production companies. We've made now five movies. We've had two TV shows, everything from Star Search to now The Benefactor. Mark Burnett's people first approached me um, about taking Donald Trump's place for The Apprentice. I'm like, you don't follow kids, animals, or hair. Yeah, so you just don't do that. So ABC had a property they called The Benefactor, which was about one person giving away a million dollars. I thought, you know what, as long as we can sit down and come up with something that's not a typical reality show, I want the experience. I mean, to have a, a network TV show, I mean, how cool is that? This is gonna be fun. <laughs> we wanted this to be very open-ended where 16 people about to walk through that door. There will only be one winner. The prize, one of you is gonna walk away with a million dollars, so you have a one 16 shot walking in. The way we narrowed it down and cut people was by creating open-end challenges, which are the type of challenges you face every day. How many owners of sports teams ended up with a primetime show? Uh, let's do a count. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think, I can't come up with anybody. Mark's unique. Mark's got something special, and people tie into that, that charisma, that energy, that enthusiasm. He's always smiling. I think he views life and success and failure all as part of a, a one big Jenga game. Cuban show is Cuban show. It sinks or swims based on his philosophy, so much based on his personality. It's so him. It gets harder and harder because you realize it's like real world. As you move up the ladder, the people you compete against are sharper, more creative. The challenge is to move up, become tougher. We're going to come back again next episode and meet in the boardroom where I will choose one of you to run one of my companies. How far you can push yourself personally to challenge yourself, to step outside your boundaries, to do the things that make you special, and to not be afraid. If you're creative enough to shine, you win. And if you're not, you don't. That's what the show The Benefactor is all about. I mean, it was our own little Sims, you know, <laughs> all together in one. It was really cool. Am I going to regret doing or not doing something? I've come to the realization the only thing I'm going to regret is if I didn't do things. 
I've had so many doors open and I'm so blessed that if there are opportunities that to experience different things and I don't take them, that's when I'll get mad at myself. Everybody always asks, does Mark Miller? I don't think he's mellowed. I think what he has is an appreciation of the fact that he's in a great place right now in his life. He's done what everybody dreams of and he's living it. I'm the luckiest guy in the world and I try to count my blessings every single day. I look at my wife, I look at my daughter. I've gotten past those financial hurdles, obviously, so now success is waking up in the morning with a smile on my face, knowing that I can challenge myself and enjoy myself, and I wouldn't change a millisecond of it all. Weeknights are about to get freak with the G-Spot. It's all into the game malicious.